Um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Peter Fewing. He was the soccer coach at Seattle University for 18 years. During that time, um, his teams have won two national championships, several conference and regional titles. Um, my favorite um, statistics in terms of wins and losses was in 2003 when with half the scholarships that Division I programs have, um, the Division II level has um, limited funding for scholarships, the Seattle University men's soccer team was able to beat Gonzaga, Seattle Pacific, the University of Washington, and the University of Portland. And I believe that year, uh, University of Portland did very well um, in the finals. <clears throat> Currently, there's three players uh, from Pete's team on the Sounders soccer team. He's won Coach of the Year two times, two-time sportsmanship award. Um, he's coached the Division II Player of the Year. He's the, been the recipient of the Fulcrum Foundation Award. He's won the service award at Seattle University from the Alumni Association. And recently he raised $1.2 million for a new soccer stadium at Seattle U. Um, but as impressive as these um, accomplishments are, I think what's even more impressive um, is what his student athletes have gone on to do after they've left Seattle University. And um, if I was to ask Pete um, what his graduation rate is, I don't even think he knows um, the actual number. What he does know is what every single student athlete has done since they've left his program. And they've gone on to do very impressive things. He has student athletes who've graduated and gone on to Creighton, University of Washington, University of Southern California, University of Virginia, NYU, gone on again to Seattle University. When they've gone on to graduate school, um, they've gone to medical school, dental school, um, they received law degrees, several, several leaders in the business community, um, and maybe even more importantly, um, he's graduated several student athletes that have gone on to be teachers. What's most impressive about Peter Fewing, again, isn't those, that list of, of accomplishments that I read first. It's what he's able to do with his soccer program and what his student athletes are able to achieve after they've been through his soccer program. So with that, it's a pleasure to introduce Peter Fewing. Thank you very much. You got that on tape? Mm -hmm. I'd like a copy of that <laughs> for my parents. <laughs> They're dead, but uh, I'll get it to them at some point. So uh, all right, well, Jennifer, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Really pleased to be with you this morning, and I, I was glad I went to see you last night. Um, by the way, I just thought of you, Ed. You won the Fulcrum Foundation Award the year before, didn't you? Yeah, that's good. So uh, Ed's, yeah, I know. <laughs> Seattle is a Jesuit school. Uh, Gonzaga is a Jesuit school, and and uh, the Jesuits talk smack to each other. So. In my early years coaching, we beat Gonzaga a number of times, and then they wouldn't schedule a game with us because we were a NAI school at the time. And it came out that our Jesuits had talked to their Jesuits and were kind of in their face a little bit. So we didn't play them for about five years. And then we got the game going again, and then we beat them three years in a row. And uh, someone yelled during a game, it was great, we're up 2 nothing at Gonzaga. And somebody yelled, our basketball team could beat your basketball team. And <laughs> they're right, they could. So. Uh, Anyway, so, uh, but it was real nice to be with you last night, nice to meet all of you, and, and I would just say that, you know, Jim's comments about relationships and one conversation at a time, the national championships and uh, where the guys have gone uh, in their careers, one conversation at a time, is, boy, I, that resonates with me, that's the truth, it's the truth, and you don't know where those conversations are going to start, and you don't know where those conversations are going to end. Um, I met my wife in the elevator of the Space Needle. I was 24 and she was 30 and I was a soccer player for Seattle and I had long hair and uh, a mullet, I think it was what it was actually. <laughs> so I was a professional soccer player making about 250 bucks a game and that conversation turned into a great marriage and three kids and we're building this camp and we're going to have an impact. So, and, and conversations that we have with people on the streets uh, about the program or with parents or I would agree with what Jim said. And then also Sarah said something last night about a vision for college athletics and having an impact. And that, for me, I started when I was 24 at Seattle U. And I'm a Catholic guy. And Seattle U had lost the year before uh, 15 to nothing to Seattle Pacific. And that, to me, as a good Catholic guy, was not very acceptable. And, and then that was on a Wednesday night. And on the Sunday, Saturday, Seattle U lost 8 nothing to the Huskies. And I was a Husky. I played here. And I called my buddy, Jeff Cook, who was a goalie, and I said, hey, how come you only beat CLU 8-0 and SPU just beat them 15-0? He said, hey, 
we didn't play any of our starters. So at that moment, I said, I'm going to call Seattle U, and I did. I put on a suit and went down and for, and I'll tell you this, because you're on your way to a career. Here's what I did to get the job. One, I learned that the job was going to be available. The, the coach was the third coach in three years, and he was moving on to medical school. And, uh, and so I planted the seed with the AD. I went in and met and said, what do you want to do with your soccer program? And, uh, and then I called on my day timer. I put down every 10 days, every two weeks, every 10 days, every two weeks. And I did that for six months. And after eight months of doing that, I got an interview. And so nervous, I sweated through the sport, the, the jacket I was wearing. And I had, to, I had to stand up during the interview to leave. And the vinyl chairs, I was stuck to the chair. I was that nervous. So I, had to, I realized I had to peel myself out of... Uh, gracefully out of that, <laughs> that situation. So, so Seattle U for me, it was a blessing for 18 years. And, and uh, Jennifer asked me to talk to you about um, some situations that happened along the way. And when I started, uh, and college sports have changed so much in 18 years. And when I played here, our coach was part-time. He was $4. Uh, he was paid $4 less than the assistant golf coach. So soccer at that time when I was playing was uh, I don't know what it's like at Kansas now, right? It's not where you played. But, but uh, it's changed a lot, and it's gotten a lot better. Uh, back when I started, in my office there was a ruler, and it was about this long. It wasn't 12 inches. It, was, it had uh, sports figures on it, and it had four posters, and then a small notepad with the names of the returning players. And from there, we were, and, and Jennifer said a lot of nice things, but I do know this. I do know that it was not me alone. It was a lot of terrific people involved to bring the, group together. Her, uh, Jennifer's husband, Herbie, is, was one of our assistant coaches as well. So, so along the way, little things happened that steered how I coached. Um, as Sarah said, I did have a vision, and, I, and I'm just now defining it after 18 years as to what that vision was. I kind of I coached by instincts. Um, I do read a lot of books about coaching. I'm a big fan of Mike Krzyzewski and John Wooden and Phil Jackson. But here's one, the first experience I had that kind of changed or kind of steered how I was going to coach. We're going on a road trip, and we were playing in Oregon, and we had a young man named Steve Fina. He does not mind me telling you this story. And Steve was not eligible at the moment. He had transferred in, and we had to go through the process of getting his grades evaluated and all that, right? You know, it's a big issue, right? So, so I said, hey, we're going to take you on the road, but you're not eligible yet, and I'll play you if you're eligible, uh, but I won't play you if you're not eligible. And so we went, and it was a Friday-Sunday gig, and and, and this is 1988, so there's no cell phones, you know, we're not, and my boss, you don't call my boss at that moment, you didn't call her at home. That was not acceptable to interrupt her weekend. Was, but that's not how it works. So, so I called throughout the day on Friday. Again, no cell phones, so we're stopping to pay phones. Is Steve eligible? No, not yet, not yet. So bottom line is he's not eligible on Friday, so he can't play. Well, Steve went on to law school, and we had a, somewhere in here, we have a Boston College lawyer, right? Right, right? And uh, I found that all my lawyers are quite intense and, and very, you know, let's get it done, let's do it now, and yada, yada, yada. So Steve was in my face about not being able to play, and I said, I can't play you, you're not eligible. Saturday comes, and I made the mistake of calling my boss at home. This is where I learned you don't call the boss at home. And, and uh, so I learned Saturday because of that phone call, he was not going to be eligible for the whole weekend. So I went back and I said, hey, you're not going to be eligible, I can't play you. Well, we're out in... Timbuktu. We're in Newburgh, Oregon. There's, you know, nobody's watching the game, frankly, and who would know if we slid a guy in? It's 1988. We only have about 13 or 14 players on the road, so why not just slide a guy in and just zip the lips and don't say anything about it? Well, I didn't play him, and he was furious. <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't sit with us, and so he went and got a tan uh, sitting over 30 yards away from the bench. When I got back, here's what I stumbled on to great lesson. I got back and walked into the uh, athletic department and I said to my boss at the time, it was a great woman, Nancy Drew, uh, I said, well, we, we won both games or split or whatever we did. And, and she, she looked at me and she said, did you play Steve Fina? And I mentioned I'm Catholic, so that immediately goes to guilt. Immediately, <laughs> even though I knew I didn't do it, uh, I just turned beet red and I felt like I started sweating. And I said, uh, no, no, we didn't, we didn't play him. And then th grace of God, I pull out of my briefcase the game rosters, which, you know, <laughs> they're in triplicate, right? And so I have Steve Fina, his name on the roster, line, ineligible, and it's signed by the referee. And I, I said, look, I, I didn't play him. <laughs> and, and you know what? I never played an eligible player. And that moment defined the rest of my 
career on do you play ineligible players or not? Or if there's gray area, do you go? And I, because of the response of my boss to me of, good for you, you passed a very important test. And she didn't know she was giving me the test at the moment, but because of that experience, she trusted me the rest of our career together. That was very good. So anytime there's gray area, I err on the side of caution, and it's never, and so, you know, I can stand in front of you, and I don't think, I'm quite confident that we never played anybody ineligible, which is good. Because stuff comes back to haunt you, it's not worth it. It's not worth the sleepless nights. It's not worth the fear of, you know, being uncovered. Another incident was with uh, our women's coach uh, at the time, and unfortunately she's passed away, but her name was Jennifer Kennedy. And we were going, to, we had to share a field. We had this guy that was, uh, he was a little pushy, and he kept wanting to come and referee a game for us. Well, he, and he was an older gentleman, and he's a bit of an odd duck, but a good guy, uh, but very pushy, very, very pushy. And he said, um, he said, I want to referee a game for you, and he kept coming back and coming back, and then we had international students living on campus before the school year started. They were in the resident halls. So they show up and say, in broken English, coach, we'd like to play your team in a game. At the same time, this guy is there, and he goes, I'll referee. I'll be here tomorrow. And I don't think he was an official referee, but he came with a full kit, and he looked good. And uh, so I'm in a bit of a quandary, and I, I go to Jennifer Kennedy, our women's coach, and I say, hey, I don't want to play a full game, but I'm in a, and I, again, I'm 24 years old, and you, know, you learn as you go. But I said, can we extend, can we play, an hour-long game, we'll play two 30-minute halves. And that would mean, can we, can we train 15 minutes into your time frame and can you go 15 minutes longer? Well, Jennifer is a terrific person, but you know, it's, there's territory, right? Okay, so, so, uh, so she agrees, which is very kind of her, and it's our first interaction together of flexibility and bending, right? And uh, so when the game gets going, Charles, this guy comes up to me and he says, Hey, we're going to play 90 minutes. I'll go sort it out with a women's coach. I'll take care of it. And I go, no, no, we're going to play 60 minutes. That's all the time we have. They're generous enough to give us 15 minutes. We're getting off the field at the one hour mark. And he goes, no, no, I'm going to work it out. And I said, no, that's not how it's going to go. So that was the end of that conversation. We come to halftime. I say, hey, instead of a 45 minute half, it's a 30 minute half, right? Cut the time frame. So I said, hey, Charles, halftime. And he's like, no, it's okay. And I go, halftime. And so I, I, I yell, halftime. And the guys come in. And he is walking off toward our women's coach like this. I can still remember. Well, you know, he's, I'm going to go show her that we're going to play the 90-minute game. And so I'm talking to the guys, and I realize what he's doing. So I run over, and I get to him as he's getting to our women's coach. And he's saying, hey, you know, we've decided we're going <laughs> we're to play 90 minutes. And I grabbed him and said, hey, we're playing 60 minutes, or we're not going to play at all. We're done. Well, that situation, immediately I recognize that we are a family, men's team, women's team, and we have to work together. And the look on Kathleen Ryan's face was, I can trust this guy. And so the program at Seattle U, men and women, I would say, and I don't know how it was at Kansas, but I, but then it's hard to bond with a group that doesn't exist. So um, <laughs> visualize, you know. Uh, so, so we have, at Seattle U, we have a great relationship, and still to this day, between the men's and the women's team. And it started that day. And, and, it, and it was innocent. You know, some of these things are very benign. You know, you don't really think about them, but it steers how you do everything from that point.